Hello, everybody. This is Mark Kep over here at CampgroundViews.com. We've put together this great video interview with Frank Rolf from RV University. So some of you have made, and I actually think a lot of you have probably come across their information. They do a lot of advertising on Facebook and YouTube, and, and they provide this RV University. So um, I actually discovered them through the Facebook group, which you can join to the link down in the video. Um, we have over 600 park operators as members now, and that's 600 parks across the country and around the world. We have members from Australia and Canada and uh, Mexico and other places where RV parks are uh, taken off who are members of this group. And so the whole point of this interview is it's not a sales pitch. It's simply an informational pitch. Let's learn about what RV University does and really get down to the heart of what it's like to own and operate an RV park. So Frank, uh, I hope that was a good introduction. Why don't you give us a little, little um, introduction into what you're doing and, and how it works? Sure, Mark, I appreciate that. Yeah, that introduction was great. Uh, ba basically, myself and my partner, Dave Reynolds, who's out of Denver, I'm over in Missouri. We started uh, buying and operating RV parks back in the mid nineties. And we've grown pretty much one property at a time to where we're now the fifth largest in the US. So uh, we operate in uh, 28 different states. So uh, pretty well, pretty well versed in the industry at this point. But we have never forgotten our roots of uh, starting just with the one property. And as a result, as a hobby, uh, we started writing about our adventures uh, in RV land, and then we put all that into a thing called RV University, which is run by my partner Dave's son Brandon. And uh, it's basically just an outreach program to people who are looking to buy an RV park or already own one and want to manage it better just to, uh, you know, keep that discussion always going among uh, RV park owners. So that's kind of the, kind of the story. You know, so I'm on your, on your profile right here on the CREUniversity.com talking about the mobile mm -hmm. home park side of the business. And, you know, I didn't realize you, so you own and operate over 2,750 mobile home parks with your partner, just the two of you. Well, well, no, we we uh, we operate. We have twenty twenty something thousand lots. Is the best way okay. to look at it, because okay. uh, so, you know the, the, the yeah the way people compare themselves is is by number of lots because individual property you could have a property with just one lot on it. So we we okay. uh, we actually we 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 have uh, we own about uh, roughly three hundred properties with about you know not not quite thirty thousand lots in it. And these are all throughout the United States. Are you outside of the U.S. also? No, we've never ventured outside the U.S. I think uh, we're, I guess we're just too uh, U.S. centric to, uh, to leave the confines of America. And I don't think we will ever venture outside of it. Uh, we're kind of drivers, not flyers. So it's kind of hard to drive your way out of America. I guess you can up into Canada. But uh, okay. no, we, uh, we, we're, we're just right here in the continental U.S. So let's go back in time a little bit. When you, when you began this, for day one, how did how did you get into this business? What what was the um, emphasis and the reason to actually start jumping into mobile home parks and then RV parks? Okay, well, what happened was uh, the, the story is a uh, strange stranger uh, than fiction. I uh, so I went to uh, Stanford University out in California. And I wanted to go to Stanford Business School or a similar business school. And back then, we're talking here the late 70s, early 80s, uh, your standard business school application, or at least the good ones, you had to have started or operated a business. Because back then, people who went to business school were often in their 30s or 40s and stuff. So I had a year, I had a year off. Uh, I, was a, I was a year ahead of my class. So... I was going to spend that fourth year that I should have been in college but had already graduated to start a business for my application. So I asked different people, what would you start for one year? Everyone's ideas were pretty stupid, except one person who said, I know you, you should build billboards. I didn't even know what a billboard was at that time. But I looked into it and thought, okay, yeah, that's a collapsible business. So basically, I just go out and get some leases along the highway. I build the sign. I rent the ad space. And then... I just sell the things off to a bigger company and that's perfect. So I started doing that at the end of the first year, I had three, three built and seven pending. I decided to go one more year to build the seven and you can guess what happened by the next year I had, you know, 10 build and five more pending. I just repeated that every year, never went to business school, did that for 14 years. And then uh, 14 years later, I got, I got bought up by a public company. And uh, so then I had to, uh, 
start all over again. So followed the same exercise. This time I called around all the various people that I had built billboards on to see uh, if they had any great thoughts of what great businesses had the best future out there. And the one that I liked the best from all those calls was a place that I had, had built two uh, billboards, which was Glen Haven uh, Mobile Home and RV Park. And so wow. that's what I did. I bought it and I just kept buying from there. I focused always on turnarounds because I was fascinated with, with seller financing. That to me was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I'd never seen that in the billboard business. It does not exist. And so the idea that someone would sell me something and carry the paper to me it was very attractive because when they did that, it reduced my risk because it was all non-recourse. All I risked was my down payment. And it and it, it also made me feel more confident because if it was really bad, they would just want to get their money and run away. Good point. Um, and, I, and I love the fact I didn't have to ever go to a bank because I hate banks because <laughs> anyone who survived the Texas SNL crash knows that, you know, when you, when you bank, often it's like you're in partnership with the devil. And I just, yeah, I, I was just massively attracted to seller financing. So basically, that's really what got me into it. And I just kept buying. I, I, what I do is I just buy a property, turn it around, buy another property, and turn it around. And then, you know, several thousand miles to the west, my partner Dave Reynolds did the exact same thing. He was a, he was a somebody did who just you, got out. Did, did, did you know each other at this time, or were you completely separate? No, no. Point? In fact, we, 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 were, we were competitors. For decades, we didn't uh, we didn't join forces until 2010. So prior to that, we were direct competitors. And you know, he started off at, with a degree in accounting, got his CPA, and then uh, he had done the he had done the books for his father, who had owned a uh, mobile home and RV park. And uh, he realized that there was way more money in that than in being an accountant. So he started buying them up about the same time I did. Uh, he wow. would typically buy it, move into it, operate it, buy the next one, move into that and operate that. Um, and so that's how we, that's how we got going. And uh, again, we used to be competitors and then we, we are now partners as of about 2010. Wow. So that's significant. So basically you, you, you're not, you're not coming at this from, and, and I mean, well, I guess, you you had your business. I mean, I imagine when you sold the the billboard business, that gave you a nice little nest egg to start out with. But then Correct. from there, you've kind of you've kind of built this from the grassroots. So you really do have the experience that everybody else would have if they're entering this market. So you you entered it from scratch. So let's jump into that now into talking about, you know, you you mentioned owner financing. Is that still prim primarily how you look to buy properties? Is that you know I've never gone through the education program. So is that is that a key tenant of what you're looking for when you're when you're buying these places, or do you operate with banks now also? Well, we do both, but for anyone who's getting into it, to me, one of the big attractions is the fact you can do that. Because when you're first starting out, it's really hard to get a loan because they're asking you, do you have any experience? And the answer is you don't, right? And so seller financing is what propels many people to being able to do bank lending. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's various styles of bank lending at the top of the pyramid. You've got, for example, your conduit lending, also known as CMBS, and that's those are great loans. But those are big loans, and the, the typical person who's buying their first property is going to be uncomfortable going out and getting a conduit loan, uh, mm -hmm. and and those require a, you know a deal size of about a million five and up. So on the stuff below that, you have two options. You have your traditional bank, but the traditional bank is always, to me. Uh, one of the less attra at least attractive because the, the note lengths are very short. It may do like a 25 year amortization, but they only want to give you a note of like three to five years. Then you have to refinance it again, and that that always scares me because you know going out and getting a loan requires you to start at least one to two years ahead to play it safe. So a three year loan, all you bought is a one year loan, in, in my opinion. So seller financing allows you not to have to do any of the bank application stuff, which is awesome. They're always non-recourse, which is awesome. And they're always super easy because there's actually no loan committee or meetings or credit checking or anything. So it's like, it's like the, the low pressure approach. Now, most, most of your larger properties, that stuff that's in the millions of dollars, those people are not prone to carry that much. 
because often they want the money. And, uh, you know, also a lot of times those big deals or deals that w- people who are a little more seasoned, a little more professional, maybe settling estates, things like that. It's the stuff that's, you know, under a million, particularly under half a million, but still is mostly a world of seller financing because there really are no banks to cite on us. And then the other thing is that until interest rates change right now, it's very attractive to sell a carry as opposed to take cash. Right. I mean, if, if I pay someone cash, the way it works is they have to pay the taxes, which, you know, you have capital gains, but you have recapture, you have your state tax. So even with capital gain structure, you're talking, let's say at least a third is gone in tax. Whereas if I, if they sell or finance, they pay no tax on anything until the money is received. And then the interest wow. rate right now on a seller note, let's say it's 5%, but all you're going to get down at good old Charles Schwab <laughs> on the good treasury point. is 2%. So they're making like wow. about two, two, two times more carrying. And then you also look at the, the collateral, if they carry the collateral is the property that they already know and have operated for decades. Versus yeah, so even if you screw up, collateral. They can, right. If, and if you yeah, screw up, yeah. they can take it over and just jump in there and do it again. So it's not, that was going to be my next question. What's their real risk? And I mean, really their risk is that they're going to have to go take over the property again, run it, find a new buyer, right? Yeah. I always tell people if I default, it would be the best day of all time. So if I default, you can resell it. You can keep my down payment and then you can resell it. <laughs> To someone to get the down payment again, right? It's not, it's not an unhappy day. Um, but you know, if you look at what happens, a lot of these moms and pops are, they don't understand how low the current interest rate environment is. So what they'll do is they'll you know, they'll go down to AG Edwards or they'll go down to Charles Schwab and say, how can I get the same five percent that the guy offered me on the on the RV park? And they'll say, oh yeah, well here here's some John Deere junk bonds yielding 4.9 and of course when those go sour you get nothing when when right. when the rv part goes sour you get the rv part back so a lot of times they they really should carry of course the biggest pushback you get from people who carry is hey i'm 75 years old so i can't carry because i'm gonna die and the answer is no you can totally carry all that happens is that first lean note goes to your heirs again, at a higher interest rate than they could achieve. And you can always sell a first lien note. First lien notes are fairly liquid. I mean, there are people huh. you can Google up and sell your first lien note to you in three days. So wow. uh, it's not an illiquid, not an illiquid item. But in, because it's there's a, a solid time, asset back again. Exactly. It's mostly, it's mostly educational because most people don't even know you can sell or finance. And often when you educate people on here's the plus of doing that, then they become fans. But until you educate them, they don't really understand what you're talking about. So we, we typically try to educate our sellers at least three times about the options of carry because often carrying is way better for them. Wow. That's so, so in that, you know, let's, so when you're educating these sellers, cause it sounds like that, you, that, that audience that you're going after who's selling a property in that five hundred thousand dollar and under range, you know, or, or at least under a million dollars, they're probably not going to be super sophisticated on on what they're doing with that. So, do you find that? Or do you say, hey, is that? Uh, let's get to how did you get to the point? Because now, now I'm imagining you're you're you've discovered this model, and this model is very successful for you both professionally and personally. So you're building this business out. When did you decide to transition over and start training people on this, and why did you do that? Well, we don't. We never transitioned. In other words, what happened was huh. we started writing small books as a hobby. Um, my small books were more theoretical, and Dave's small small books were more based on accounting. So we kind of organically grew what what, what we do, and the concept was that back back in the mid nineties. There really weren't any books or guides or anything to the industry. And so we, we thought the more we could contribute there, the better. And we've looked, looked at the industry kind of like a fraternity. And it's not like an all guys fraternity because there are women who also own properties. But in other words, just theoretically, kind of like a coming together of like-minded individuals. And um, 
So we've we've always had fun with it. I mean, it's a little known secret that most people don't know, but I, I used to uh, teach college as a hobby, starting all the way back to when I was in college. I was the youngest teacher, I think, in Stanford history. I taught um, public speaking starting as a uh, as a junior, and wow. uh, Dave, yeah, and Dave, Dave uh, taught accounting um, one night a week at at a uh, a university there in Denver. So I've, I've always taught. It's always been kind of a part of my personality. I've always taught um, at least one night a week my entire life since I was in my 20s. And then when I moved from Dallas to Missouri, there was no college nearby. So I just expanded my writings on the industry. But um, that, we've, always, we've always kind of been teachers. I guess we're, I guess we're frustrated, you know, want to be college professors or something. So that's kind of where a lot of that comes from. It's just well, it's, I it's, imagine it's just you're, you're, you're a hobby. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there's that old line of uh, people who do do and people who can't teach. But it sounds like you're actually you flip that on its head. You're somebody who's doing and teaching, and so that that brings a very unique perspective to your students because they know they're learning from somebody who's actually doing this and, and successful at it. So um, I imagine it sounds like you started out with some mobile home parks. At what point did you start getting into RV parks? And um, sure. is there a, is there a difference between the two? Well, you know, uh, my very first property was mobile home and RV. Okay. And then it's been pretty much the model throughout. We have some that are dedicated 100% pure RV. We have some that are 100% dedicated pure uh, MH or manufactured home. But there's always been a hybrid because we we, we have traditionally just bought good deals. And we're, we're willing to play either either game, and they're both both fairly similar. I mean, a lot a lot of the RV parks we have, we have some that are true RV parks, uh, but we have others that are uh, situations that are RV parks where basically people live in them full time or nearly full time. So I mean, the, you know, the RV industry is is a you know it's, it's a pretty varied playing field, I and mean, there's a lot of right. facets to it. It's not just all one thing, right? So Right. Uh, I mean, people drive around. They think, oh, look, there, there, there's an RV park, but there really isn't any set standard one. There's the there's the luxury ones that cater to people who are just visiting, all the way down to more down and dirty ones that uh, just cater to people who basically park there because they work there, or they park there because they want to retire there and live full time. And um, so we we just basically pursue. The deals based on economics, financing, location, and and then we let them morph into whatever they want to be. We've had properties that were RV that have, that have segued into more MH, and we've had parks that had more MH on the front end who segued more into, into more RV. Um, okay. But we, so we, we we basically play all all the different varieties. So now you have um you have the mobile home university, and then you also have the RV park university. Is mm -hmm. what are the differences between the two, and what are the similarities between the two? Well, you know, the biggest difference between the two is the the RV industry, the actual property itself, is different as far as the marketing and the management. Probably with the two biggest differences between RV and MH. So when you have an RV property, because it is if it, if it's a, if it's a pure true. RV, RV as far as recreational property, uh, you're going to offer obviously lots of amenities to attract people, and they're going to be more demanding of that because that's the business model, right? So the owner of that is going to be part concierge, part troubleshooter, part marketing genius, part you know manager, and yeah. whereas on the M8 side it's more passive because you traditionally don't really offer any amenities, you're basically just renting renting the land. So that's one of the big issues. The other big yeah, issue like, is one. It's like a multifamily. Go ahead. I mean, so a mobile yeah, home you, park's like running a multifamily right. versus an RV park like running a hotel, right? I mean, would that be the, yep. the big difference? Yep. You are uh, you are exactly correct. And um, so that's one of the big differences. And then also, just like those two differences, the way you would advertise a market, a hotel is completely different than how you would advertise a market apartments. So basically, the, the the actual operations are not much different. The uh, the expense line items are pretty much identical, although there's some that are that are meatier in one than on the other. 
Um, but the, but the big, the two biggest differences to me would be in the advertising to get occupancy and then just the, the management side of it, because you are more like operating a restaurant with RV than you are an MH. Wow. Okay. So what we're getting, all, obviously the economy is good right now. A lot of people have got a lot of cash and, and also, as you mentioned, interest rates are low. And so there's, there's this, um, hunger for returns. And so as a result mm -hmm. of those factors, we see a lot of people who are interested in buying an RV park or buying a mobile home park or getting into this business. And that was why, you know, I discovered you and reached out to you because I thought you were right in the, in the right place at the right time. So what is your take sure. on the state of the industry? Where do you see it now and where do you see it in the future? And again, we'll caveat that with this is all opinion. Um, seek your own uh, financial and tax advice. But, um, you know, where do you see things going right now? Well, first off, I think you uh, you pinpointed one of the big items right now, which is everybody is getting completely disappointed uh, in traditional investments because they're lousy and they make no money. And yeah. it's almost become like a, a, a con game of people uh, entrusting their money into various so-called money managers who don't actually produce any form of return. I mean, if you look at private equity, for example, private equity over the last three years has returned an average of what is like 4%. Uh, the stock market, as we all know last year, did not even end up in the black. It was down five or six percent and then you, you add inflation to that and you're losing money like crazy so if you put a dollar in the stock market last year and held it for the entire year all you have to show for it including inflation is you lost about 10 percent so you're having i think kind of a revolution among smarter people saying this conventional stuff doesn't make money anymore i'm not making any money in stocks i'm not making any money in bonds I'm not making any money in cds or treasuries th those things come in at or slightly below inflation so everyone's realizing that if they want to make any money with their money, they've got to turn to alternative investments. And alternative investments are things that people didn't use to invest in, yet they've been around a while, uh, but they require people to go outside their comfort zone. So the mm -hmm. first thing I think you see is you're seeing more and more people willing to get outside their comfort zone because they're just not making any money. And so that's, that's a key item that's going on. Then you have people looking at the mega yeah. trends. Yeah, well, and then you look at the mega trends in America and saying, okay, if I'm going to invest in alternative investments, I want to be in something that seems to be properly timed to actually work. And the RV industry has one extremely potent mega trend, and that is the fact you've got 10,000 baby boomers retiring, retiring boomer. per day. Yep. Right. So you've got you've got 10,000 new potential customers each day, which is incredible. And uh, and so that's fueling what have been the highest sales of RVs in American history. And it's like every year is higher than the year prior. Now, the other part, the other mega trend that nobody knew until recently, or maybe not. I mean, they might have seen the evidence of a few years ago, but the industry has also become very attractive to younger generations. That's the part no one figured on. Everyone thought that RV was going to be fueled by this 10,000 a day boomer thing. And it was merely a matter of time and demographics until that would occur. But the part that no one anticipated was the fact that they're becoming very popular with younger people. You know, they've studied why, like why are younger people attracted? And they found that they just kind of like the adventureness and the simpleness and the bonding time of the outdoors, right? I mean, a study recently showed their number one thing people loved in RV parks was outdoor cooking. Right? How, how yeah. crazy. That was the number one amenity. And uh, so you have about as many youthful entrants as you do the boomers. So it's kind of getting, getting a demand in two different directions. And I don't really see that slowing because they're both, you know, basically demographic and just, and just consumer demand. And I don't yeah. see it lessening. I don't, I don't see young people becoming different. And no, I, I don't see you. old people yeah. becoming different. So yeah, that, you know, we're, you know, obviously, go ahead. Yeah, we're on the marketing side, and, and those those two factors you mentioned, the young and the boomers, are driving the growth, and we we agree with that. Um, we see that on our end also that there is just this 
unbelievable demand. And so on the, um, and one of the things, let's, let's dovetail this a little bit. So one of the things that's happened is the industry recognized, industry being the RV manufacturing industry side of the business, they recognize that they're right. pumping out these units left and right. And so one of the big wonders that's out there is, are they going to end up creating so many RVers that there's no places for people to stay? And so, uh, I, you know, let's, let's dovetail a little bit into that. What do you see as, because obviously there's going to be limits on the ability of somebody to build an RV park and mobile home park. Where do you see the, the industry on, on your side of the business? How are adjustments being made to take on this additional demand? And where is that going to take us? Well, you know, I just came back from uh, a, um, an event down in Texas, which was a, uh, a bunch of uh, owners of properties down there. One of the big topics was greenfield development. And I think what you're going to see is uh, as the demand rises and the supply dwindles, you're obviously Actually, let's, see let's, new development. Go ahead. Yeah, and so green greenfield development is new development, correct? Yeah, just new development. So we're taking a nice okay. green field and, and building something new. Um, okay. I think what you'll see is you'll see more development, but maybe new types of it, development based on demand. For example, those people who are looking – for permanent habitation in an RV park, they may build RV parks just for them, right? For example, you know, there's huge demand right now in tiny homes, which are ANSI code. They're not HUD coded. You cannot put them in mobile home parks. You only put them in RV parks, but they don't move. And so there are people right now, as we speak, building these properties down outside of Austin and outside of Houston. And uh, they're a unique creation. They don't look like anything anyone's ever built before. Hmm. So basically, you know, you imagine kind of a parkland setting that's peppered with uh, with uh, RV park models hmm. and uh, with with kind of unique amenities. And the stuff I saw was very very upscale. They're 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 really really put a lot of effort in the aesthetics of it. And, and what um, are they designing? What are they designing those properties for? For people to live in, or for people to vacation? Yes, those are those are no, those are people to. Uh, in other words, this would be attractive to the person who wants all the attributes of an RV park, only for full time habitation. Okay. So, in other words, someone who might be might be living in a, in a RV park now, that's predominantly people who who are, you know, here today and then moving on. These are people who are who want the permanent RV park setting for their uh, for what would be a park model. Hmm. So they swap in the RV basically for a park model. Um, so so I see that that going on. You you've got and I also see development of new regular standalone RV parks, uh, more more luxury RV parks. And they're, whenever you have supply and demand gets super duper tight, the the whatever the price per lot gets to a certain level, people always say to themselves, "Well, why should I pay that much? I'll just build my own, right?" Yeah. Yep. And I've I've seen more pressure this year than ever before for people who want to build new stuff. So I think you'll start seeing new stuff being produced. Now, as we all know, it's not that easy to build new stuff, right? You have to have just the right zoning, you have to have the right permitting, you have to have access to water. There's, there's many other issues. So it's not like you can just go out, or, uh, go out overnight and start building a bunch of stuff. But I think mm -hmm. you definitely will see some new stuff coming. Now, the beauty of new stuff coming is new, new stuff is very expensive. Uh, some of the stuff I was talking to people about that they're building, they're spending 125000 per lot to build it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, how that for a minute. When you, when, you're char when you are spending that much, you have to charge a lot. And that is a great opportunity to get a reset on, on rents, right, and valuations. Because as those things come up and they're so very expensive, it makes everyone else say, ah, well, maybe I wasn't charging quite enough. So I see nothing wrong with people building new stuff because it's going it, it to cause rents to go up. It's actually very, it's very, very profitable niche for people to be owning things when they start building new because it naturally, just by comparison, makes things go up. You know, it's an so, interesting point. Let's, let's go, yeah, on that pricing thing. I mean, one of the, it, it's an interesting market to be in because, you know, one of the things with like mobile home parks 
is, and I'm not, I'll, I'll do a broad brush. I don't want to be super specific, but generally speaking, folks are living in mobile home parks. They're, they're there because of the price of the mobile home park, right? It's less expensive than a home or apartment or whatnot. Um, and then yeah, on the flip side, the most, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, so for the most part, that's correct. That's the most part. That's right. So as as we see that, what are you seeing as an op? Since you own so many sites, when you're when you're raising rates, you know. So let, let's talk to the people who are looking at either buying a park or they currently own and an operate a park. What considerations should they have, or should or should they even have these when raising rates? And and how do you go about doing that? Especially say you're operating a park where most of the folks are are lower income, fixed income. And, you know, that, that $100 per month increase could be the difference between them eating, you know, four meals a day and three meals a day. I mean, what, how do you handle that type of stuff? Well, the, the uh, first thing is you would never want to raise your rents ever $100. I can tell you that. We know, we know that from experience. Um, the, the, m- most of your rents in the M8 sector are crazily low. And they're crazily low because the mom and pop owners never kept track of inflation and they mm-hmm. never sought out trying to maximize their business which seems kind of crazy but it's like someone had a v8 engine and you're perfectly happy if only four cylinders are working on it and you never even seem to have the curiosity to know what could be its full potential and we call that mom and pop quantitative easing so what they did was they basically took it upon <laughs> themselves to make the conscious choice not to maximize the rent which is kind of strange. Like I can't name any other business in American history that anyone has ever done that with, but that's just the way it worked out. And so now what you're trying to do is you're trying to like raise, raise the rents to catch up for decades of inflation, right? But that's a painful process because the residents, even though the rents are crazy low, that's what they got in their household budget. And what they've done is when your household budget is X and you take out your rent, you find ways to spend all the rest of the money. And so the money's there, but people have to now recalibrate for changing the rent. So what we found is most people can handle a rent increase that's roughly $50 a month or less. And I guess what they do is they say, well, that went up $50, but I can cut back on one casual dining experience at Chili's and I'm even. Right, but when you get up mm-hmm. to a hundred dollars, it's a lifestyle change. Is a hundred dollars? They're having to cut some thing out of the budget. It's not really a reallocation. It's it's now much more painful. So at a hundred dollars, they're going to have to drop a whole segment out of what they do. They're going to say, oh well, I guess I'll have to give up, you know, my gym membership. I guess I'll have to give up going to the whatever yeah. the basketball game or whatever and. So we try and keep any, any rent, rent increases under 100, but it is, it is a very painful and serious part of America that we've got to, I mean, we're like the, the last frontier of the rents being way too low and uh-huh. got to find a way to get them up. And, uh, and if you don't get them up, what happens is you, you end up with redevelopment. That, that's that, that's Redevel- the threat really to all... Yeah, all, all all RV and MH properties throughout America, particularly in the big cities, uh, is that we're not a super high land use. And right. the other land uses have become extremely uh, expensive in what they do. And so they can afford to pay so much that they can often buy the existing RV park or mobile home park and demolish it. And, you, and for example, I was just in Austin. You know, we have properties in Austin. And, you know, Austin is like ground zero of that. There are a lot, a lot of, well, I just drove by at the airport a few days ago, another RV park that had been scraped over by the airport. And you can tell why in Austin, because in Austin, the average apartment rent is $1,500 a month. It would make mm-hmm. no sense to have an RV park, particularly an older RV park that doesn't have very high rents with buildable land for apartments. Why in the world would you not just buy it and demolish it? Interesting. And that, you know, and go ahead. It's interesting that you brought. So, you know, really, there is a lot of change going on. And so, you know, somebody in your role who's been doing doing this the way you have been teaching it. If you were starting out, if if you were if you were you back when you were starting out, way back when, you know, remember that first property. What advice mm-hmm. would you give yourself 
entering this business now? What, what type of property would you tell you to look for? What type of deal would you look for? How would you advise you in the past to get into this industry? Well, the first thing I would advise me is to go ahead and do it because even today where I have sufficient cash to invest in many things, I can't find anything investing in that's as attractive as uh, RV and MH. So there's no, uh, so there's no question in my mind, the timing is still good. I mean, when I, when I sold my billboard business, the reason I didn't get back in it was it, it's time had ended because mm. all businesses kind of have a life cycle and there's a time to get in them and there's a time to get out of them, whether it's automobiles or Hollywood or you name it. There's typically a point in history that people can say, oh, yeah, that was the time to get out. And then those who didn't look like fools and those who did look like geniuses. Well, our, our time has not come yet because we're still in enough infancy now. The industry is still growing and is nowhere near re reached its top yet. So item one is I would tell myself to go ahead and do it. Item number two is I would look at the playing field out there and bear in mind real estate is all about capital. Right. I mean, it's really hard to get into stuff. Dave, Dave and I both have done collectively 12 zero down deals. But, you know, by and large, there, you have to have some capital to get into real estate or a really a, a burning desire that's big enough to overcome the fact you don't have a lot of capital. And based on the capital you have kind of is going to uh, give you an idea of what you need to be buying. And what's like what's in your what's in your dollar range as far as buying. And, you know, if you take, take what you have capital wise and multiply that times 10, it's simply about the outer limit of where you're at. So that would, that would, okay. that would define like financially. So I have $50,000. I should be looking at something that's $500,000 or less. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but basically correct. Now I'm not going to say that's across okay. the board true because again, we, we've, we've done 12 different deals with $0 down. In other words, the seller carried 100%. But let's be honest on those deals, they were, they were screwed up. That's why the guy did zero down. <laughs> so a zero down deal that I have to put $100,000 to fix is not really zero down. Yeah, that's right? true. Now, we, we have had a few bizarro differences. Like we once bought a deal from a bank, and it, was, it, was, it actually was an RVMH property in the Midwest. Weirdest deal we've ever seen. We got it. We 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 constantly call different people looking for deals, and we call yeah. banks and let them know, hey, we buy foreclosed properties. And the guy calls up and says, hey, I got a foreclosed property, and you're the first person I'm calling. And would you be interested? And so basically, I just jump in my car and I drive to the property. And when I get there, I can't be in the right property because the property <laughs> is mint. It has nothing wrong really? with it. The roads are perfect. The entrance is perfect. The sign is perfect. Everything's perfect. He's got like 80% occupancy. So I call up At the bank and say, hey, am I, where, am I in the right spot? Can you help me define where I am? And they're like, what do you see? I'm like, well, I see a, a medical building here at the entrance. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. What do, you, what do you think? And I said, well gosh, I don't know. It's kind of rough. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know it's rough. Here's the deal. Uh, we'll do a zero down. You just take over the note and oh my it's God. yours. And we no still kidding. never figured it out. Yeah, true story. All we can figure is that the guy, uh, sometimes borrowers themselves become unbankable, right? Mm -hmm. Because they, they, uh, they go out and buy a McMansion and default on it. So the, the property is fine, but the borrower is not. And so- oh all we've ever figured out on the deal, we never really wanted to know the truth because we didn't want the bank to know that, that it really was meant. <laughs> but we think that what happened was that the guy went into term default because he was not bankable. And then the, no one ever bothered to find out why it had defaulted. Because wow. otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so there's one that was truly zero down and I didn't put a penny in it. But normally if there's zero down, you have to put some money in. So that's why uh, uh, you know, again, ten, 10 times, there's many, many miles of possible carry with even 10% down, even on a decent property. But that, that's why, so basically your capital times 10. So in that case, yes, if you had 50, then you'd be looking probably around half a million bucks. Okay. Right. Uh, n number two thing 
or number three things, number two or three, that I would say that you would want to do is you, you want to look for stuff that can really make money. And by that, I mean that it's nowhere near potential. I, I hate properties that are already running in all eight cylinders because there's like not a lot of value add, and therefore there's not a lot of money in it. So I, I like have always liked and always will like properties that have something wrong with them, not physically. I mean, I want it to be a good location, but operationally they're screwed up. You know, the guy's either he's overpaying the manager wildly or he's doing something else stupid on the expense side or he's not marketing it effectively at all. Hmm. That kind of stuff. So I'm always looking that's really, for that. That, that takes ahead. some entrepreneurial spirit there for that that little piece. Being able to identify that that gem in that coal mine there is is that is key. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know a lot of a lot of the folks that follow us they're in that space where they kind of, you know, usually what happens is, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, especially in the RV park side, usually what happens is somebody actually buys an RV and starts traveling and they're like, I could do this better. This is horrible. You know, I, this is beautiful park is being run, run wrong. So can you talk a little bit about that, about what, you know, let's go a little bit deeper on that, that things to look for that would be key aha moments. I can do this better. Or I can do, I can take this property and, and make it a, a real diamond. What would you look for? Yeah, they're, they're yeah, they, they almost all revolve around the manager. Number one, uh, we have bought properties where the managers were wildly overcompensated. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we bought a property in Kansas City. It's the oldest property we ever bought. It was built in 1935 or something. Wow. And the guy had a manager there. He's paying the manager $108,000 a year. Oh, geez. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> So we looked, we looked at the guy's numbers and thought, well, let's see, I can right off the bat increase the net income by 50 or 60,000 a year. I'm just going to fire the manager. And so the number one biggest mistake we see are managers who are wildly overcompensated. And we, and we find managers all the time that are being paid in the six figures, which is crazy. Now, I'm, I don't even mean on giant properties. Um, so that's, that's item one. Also stemming from the bad manager or the manager who's overcompensated and typically not worthy of it, you have a uh, poor property condition, which, you know, is not expensive to fix, right? A lot of times you pull into a property and it looks ugly, but you really take it apart piece by piece on a sheet of paper like this, you know, here are the top 100 things wrong. They don't cost anything, right? Hmm. I mean, coat of paint, sign, coat coat of paint. I can yeah. sign, yeah, a coat of paint will fix almost anything. Hey, let's paint the speed bump. Hey, let's cut the yard better. Hey, let's paint over the rusted fence. It's not a lot of money. Huh. And yet it's poor, it's poor condition scares people away. Nobody, nobody wants to stay anywhere where it's not maintained. It, it's right. just insulting. And, and it makes you feel like, oh, this must be a really bad place. Even the lo location can be great. In fact, it's got a broken window. Just doesn't make you feel very good about stuff, right? And then the yeah. third one, probably 800 pound gorilla, is is the marketing advertising i mean it's it's shocking and i know you see it all the time oh yeah person oh, yeah. who does not even have internet presence like they're not even <laughs> searchable on google nor or, do or let me yeah you're you're hitting my sweet spot there that's something that it shocks me because the reality is the internet is where people find places to stay now it's period it's it's the billboard of, of modern times and it always shocks me when i find a Wix website that still has the free Wix ad at the top or a website yeah. that was built by, you could tell their nephew or something like that. It's like, this is the first entry point for every guest that comes into your park. It should look like you want it to look. It shouldn't look like you home built it. So yeah, sorry. Sorry. I'm throwing my two cents in there, but go ahead. Well, no, no, you're, you're completely correct. It, it would be like having a, you know, a restaurant in today's world that is not searchable on Google. Right. I mean, typically when yeah. I'm anywhere and I don't know where I am, uh, and I'm going to go to a restaurant, I will Google in restaurants in blank. And if you don't pop up, you're not even on the list. And then once I pick one, I'll, I'll look at its website to see it, would I want to go there or not. And if yep. you deny people that capability, you're crazy. There's no way you yeah. can. I mean, if that was mega expensive, you might say, well, I can't really afford it as a business. But it's all, almost free. So that's, it is. that's yeah. stupid. So we see a yeah. lot of that. And then you'll see a lot of times the property that has beautiful frontage and no signage at all. 
It's another mind uh-huh. blower, right? So, so it's right out, right on the interstate highway, and their sign is an eight by ten sheet of plywood that's half <laughs> fallen off. And you look at that and go, my God, let's see here. I could take that sign down and put in a professional quality sign for what, a thousand dollars, and I could put in some feather flags for one fifty each, and I could put in some three rail white vinyl fence for ten dollars linear foot, and you could redo the whole package and make the thing look spectacular for not a lot of money and yet they but, don't do it they're either they're either yeah, but, blind you know you can't see the vision or they think it's too expensive or something you know you you have the experience with the signage so what would be your key points you kind of hit on them there with the the, the picket fence the the banners and the signage what would be your key tips for good signage for an, an rv park a motorhome park on the street what do you what do you need okay, on your well, property let, let's let's first go back to we we are huge fans of that product known as white vinyl, right? We love white vinyl. It doesn't always have to be white vinyl. We also make tan vinyl, but we love the white vinyl product because you don't have to paint it. It always looks fantastic. It's self-cleaning. The best product ever made, and the best of all, it's really cheap. How often in life do you get great products that are cheap? Normally, great products are incredibly expensive, so we all settle for not great products because they're cheap. So this is the one time that the, that the Dollar Tree product is also the best. So our entrances all revolve around white vinyl. We typically always put in three, three rail white vinyl fencing down all of our frontage. And you might say, why three rail? Well, we've tested both. We tested two rail and four rail. The four rail is too solid looking, not very inviting, and the two rail is too small. So we like the three rail, which we also conveniently use to hang banners on because we love banners. So I put in my white vinyl three rail fencing down the entire frontage. And I, A, I look fantastic. B, I stand out when you're driving down the road. You always look when you see that, that beautiful white fencing. You always are going to look sure. over at it. And then we yeah. use it to put banners on it, right? Then all of our signage inside the property, we get rid of all those old rusted metal posts. And everything is done on a white vinyl post with, with a nice PVC top. Right, you know, an ornament, ornamental top, or they now make the ornamental yet solar powered lighted tops. Doesn't matter, whatever you want to do. But again, get, get rid of everything out of your property that's vertical, that's stuck in the ground, and replace it all with white vinyl. Now, the sign out front, what you have is, I mean, you have, you have many, many options for that. But for most people, you're trying to get maximum bang for the buck. If you want to get maximum bang for the buck, just get as, a, as large a sign as the law and or your budget will allow, that is solid sheet of aluminum that's already pre-painted, whatever color pleases you. It could be green, could be blue, could be red, with the white vinyl lettering that they do at Fast Signs or a number of other vendors, and you're, and you're good to go. And you, and you hold that thing up there on your white vinyl post with beautiful caps, and you look like a million bucks. And then if you want to really, really, really spice it up, put feather flags behind that all, all the way down the front. We, we typically space them about 50 feet apart. So if oh. you are going down the highway and you see the white vinyl fence and then you see feather flags spaced 50 feet apart behind it and whatever colors again please you, and typically colors that are the same palette as your entry sign, you look like a million bucks, but you didn't spend anywhere near a million bucks, right? If you were to price wow. that out, it's about, it's about 10 bucks per linear foot on the fencing. So let's say you've got 500 feet of frontage, then, then it's 5,000 for the fence. Perfectly reasonably priced. Our typical entry sign is running us $2,000, right? And the feather flags are, let's say, even if you're not a good shopper, they're $200 each. So going back to 500 linear feet of frontage, I would need 10 feather flags. So I would need 2,000 of feather flags, 2,000 sign. 5,000 in fence. I would be in and out of that entire thing, including the banners for 10,000 bucks. Now let's look, at, <laughs> let's look at the impact of your marketing of that. If I did that and I spent $10,000, I would imagine I'm going to get that back really fast, right? Because people, people now I'm going to go from looking like a place no one wants to go to, to somewhere where everyone wants to pull in and I will make that back completely and increased revenue. You're right. right. And so, so, so you've changed your manager. You've changed that first impression with both the website and the frontage. And I imagine on the back end, you would see a, an immediate dramatic increase. Like say that park was ranking a three and a half before stars. 
when you do these changes, I would imagine your, your just your star ratings alone would go up to a uh, full point, you know, four and a half stars just for those changes alone. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, because what happens is we're all as humans prone to first impression. And when you go in a property that's not very good, but has a great entry, you always say to yourself, what a nice property. And then you go in, it's not as good, but you, it's like you're still you're still flying through on the initial uh, good vibe that you had. And wow. then when you flip flop it, when you have a great property but a terrible entry, your first impression is what a nasty property. So then your brain yeah. goes, what a nasty property, but it's not too bad, right? <laughs> and yeah. so yeah, it, it, and you know that flavors everyone. It flavors appraisers and bankers and customers and future buyers and everyone is flavored by first impression. Anyone who doesn't believe that's wrong. So, and I know, I know, and I've talked to people who own properties and, you know, after we tie it up and stuff and, Hey, did you ever think about, you know, working on the entry? Nah, no one cares about the entry. That's just the cover <laughs> on the book. People pull in then, no, that isn't true. Cause people don't even pull in if it doesn't look good. I mean, how many times have you driven down the highway and it's noon and you pull off and you're some small town, you're going to judge the restaurant completely on the exterior. I do. True. I yep. mean, if I, if I pull in and it looks like a freaking disaster where, you know, the, it's not, the building's not painted, the sign's falling down, I'm not going to eat there because I'm going to figure yeah. that whoever would let the, the thing look so bad on the outside is probably not even cleaning the kitchen. It's Very just human point. nature. And, uh, but so, yeah, I think entries are absolutely key. I don't think, I don't think you can have a top rated property without a nice entry. I just don't think you can't. Craig, I don't want to take too much of your time. This has been an amazing interview and I hope we can do more of these. So let's, let's go into how people can find you and connect with you and be able to learn. Cause I, I think we've only scratched the very surface of what you're providing in information. So let's, let's tell people how they can find you, connect with you and learn more from you. Well, the best thing to do, and again, the, all, all of the educational stuff we do is run by uh, Brandon, who's my uh, partner's son, Brandon Reynolds. And the best way to find, find the website and Brandon is rvuniversity.com. Uh, and if you go on there and sign up, you know, I, I, I write a lengthy monthly newsletter that just reviews all kinds of uh, topics that I see out on the road. I mean, bear in mind, I'm on the road a lot. I drive 100,000 miles a year. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I, I basically all I do is drive between our properties. Uh, that's my one superhuman skill is I'm able to outdrive everyone. So, um, <laughs> you know, so as I'm driving around, I take pictures of things I see, new things I see, old things I see, scripts that people make, and then I, I, I guess for fun, write write about those, and then I compile those into that monthly newsletter. So uh, if anyone wants it, it's completely free. Uh, just go to go to rvuniversity.com and uh, sign up for the newsletter. That that will get you in the loop on, on the very stuff that 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 I write. And uh, then you can also see all of Brandon's contact information as well. But you know we have basically at the website what we have is we have the newsletter which is free, and then we have a course uh, that we wrote on how to properly you know buy and turn around and operate RV parks also that's offered on there. And then we also have a lot of other free content. So it's, 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 it's very content rich. There's, there's no sales pitching any of it. It's just, it's just basically a big old pile of content, like a library. That's what it is. That's amazing. So then on the other side, on the mobile home park side, I imagine they can go to the CREUniversity.com and, and collect information there. Um, for the well, real yeah, on, the, on the mobile home side, you can go to MHU.com. MHUuniversity.com okay. and same items there. I, I do a monthly newsletter on that. I've got a course on how to properly uh, buy, turn around, and operate mobile home parks. So it's basically it's basically a mirror image. And then we also have a, uh, a an event which is like a three day immersion weekend where we actually it's part in classroom, part out in the field. That where we is for both RV and MH in one spot at the same time. Because the businesses and when's the next are so. One of those classes uh, next one coming up on that is in uh, let me think here, Orange County, California, uh, February. I don't know if I can find it quickly enough here. Let's sort here. It's February. Okay. Uh, one, two, uh, February twenty second through twenty fourth. Wow, and that's in Orange that's County. Next. Cool. 
you know, I'm, you can, I'm out of yeah. South, I'm out of Thousand Oak. I may, I may have to attend one of these things. Well, you'd be, you know, be, be our guest here. I mean, we're, uh, you know, we, what we do is, and we, we basically just for three days go over every way to identify, evaluate, negotiate, perform due diligence on, renegotiate, finance, turn around and operate uh, RV and mobile home parks. So it's, it's basically just, uh, it's like a college course is actually how it's designed. So we are, we are uh, two day, two days in a room and one day in the field. Wow. So, Frank, I, uh, yeah. I appreciate your time on this. I'm going to put the link to all this information down below in, in the video description. I hope you have found this useful. I know I have. When, I, when I'm learning, I'm sure you're learning. Make sure to connect with them at rvparkuniversity.com and the mobilehomeuniversity.com. As you can clearly see, you're going to be uh, engaging with some seriously engaged and knowledgeable people. There's nothing better than doing that. So, Frank, I appreciate your time, and thank you. If you want to check out more about you us, bet. go to campgroundviews.com. And also, we have the link below to the Facebook group. There's over 600 park operators that are now members. If you want to engage with people who are in the industry, we're making those connections. Thank you, and goodbye.